everything good on testing that? So I, it's an honor to be here. I actually was invited up when I was in DC last fall doing a sabbatical. Pat Fagan was who I was working with, who was actually speaking here. They invited me to come up and attend, and I just said, I've, I've got to bring my students here next year, and thankfully I have a bunch here. Some of you have met them. Actually, there's quite a few. You probably couldn't get away from them, even if you wanted to. So, um, so this is a topic that's very near and dear, dear to my heart. When I speak at the UN, I have to throw out five or six disclaimers at the beginning, because I'm usually speaking to a wide variety of audience, a lot of radical feminists there. So I have to throw a lot of disclaimers out so they don't immediately have this harsh startup and like, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. So I don't really am going to throw all these disclaimers out now. I may have to throw them out during the Q&A, but right now I'm just going to dive right into it. Um, since it's Halloween season and being a father of daughters myself, uh, and I have a son too, I, don't br I probably won't bring him up much. <laughs> He's a teenage boy, he gets on my nerves, so I'm not going to talk about him. I'm just kidding. No, I will probably bring him up, but not nearly as much as my daughters. My daughters are telling me what they wanted to dress up for Halloween. And my wife is a seamstress, she's really good at making stuff, so she's buying these little pieces and putting them together. Um, I wish I could show you a bunch of pictures, but we don't have time for that right now. So my seven-year-old daughter wants to be a witch. Or no, a cat. She wants to be a cat. One of my other daughters want to be a witch. and. I can't remember what my third daughter wants to be because she keeps changing her mind. But that being said, none of them said they wanted to be a French maid. Let me read you an excerpt from a book. This is from uh, Leonard Sachs. He's written several really good books. He's a, a psychologist and also a family um, medical doctor, family practitioner that way. So here's uh, a, an excerpt from his book. He says, girls are getting sexier earlier. That's not a good thing. Kathy, this is somebody he spoke with, a mother, has a fond memory of one particular Halloween from her childhood. This is what Kathy's story. My grandmother came to America from Bavaria as a young girl. So one year when I was a little girl, uh, I tried trying to decide what I should be for Halloween. My grand or my mother suggested that I should dress up like a Bavarian immigrant girl. She spent a month sewing a genuine Bavarian dirndl for me. She taught me how to wear it. My mom helped. Looking back, I can see that it was a chance for three generations, me, my mom, and my mom's mom, to do something together. Grandma even taught me how to say, I'm, not, I'm going to slaughter this one, I'm trying anyway, e be a barishie ma dil, which means I'm a Bavarian girl. I was so proud, she says. Hopefully nobody's from that country, and if you do speak it, just be patient. Um, then she, she goes on to say, when my daughter was 10, I told her that uh, we could have a, a dirndl made for her Halloween costume, just like the one I had worn. She looked at me like I was crazy and said, uh, <laughs> I know what I'm going as, Mom. She said is, is, is a stu in a tone that said, how stupid could you be? She'd already picked out a costume for herself at the store. It was a French and made outfit with a fishnet pantyhose and a frilly miniskirt. This was an outfit marketed to 10-year-old girls, and they even had it in smaller sizes. Unbelievable, I told my daughter. No way. She threw a fit, so we compromised on a cheerleader outfit. And here's what's weird, Kathy continued. The boys' costumes haven't changed much from what the boys wore when I was little. When I was a girl, boys would dress up as Darth Vader or a Jedi Knight or a Teenage Mutant Tur uh, Ninja Turtle, and they still do. Well, Justin Bieber, right? That's what we dress up now. Um, <laughs> but, but so many of the girls today, 9 and 10 and 11-year-old girls, seem to feel as though they have to dress up in something really skanky. How come? I've never heard of a boy who wanted to dress up like a Chippendales dancer, the mom says. So this is what Leonard Sachs goes on to say. It's not just Hall uh, Halloween. In many different ways, our popular culture now pushes elementary school girls to dress and act in ways that would have been unimaginable for middle school, middle school girls 20 or 30 years ago. Hot pants, low-rise jeans, and midriff tops are now common apparel for girls in third grade. Girls who are dressing up in these outfits prior to the onset of puberty are not expressing their sexuality. They don't have and should not have a sexual agenda to express. Dressing sexually in the absence of sexual desire is simply conformism. And it may create long-term problems. As Berkeley professor of psychology, Stephen Hinshaw, observes, quote, if girls pretend to be sexual before they really are sexual, they're going to find it much harder to, to connect with their own sexual feelings, unquote. 
So um, I was grateful that my daughters weren't wanting to, and I actually had a conversation with my wife about this. She said when she was a teenager that that was still fairly common. It wasn't as bad, as rampant as it is now, but to dress up like a, um, um, a prostitute or something like that. And we had a conversation about why that is. Leonard Sachs, I won't go into what he says in the book, but he gives four factors that are, his, the book is called Girls on the Edge. He has another book called Boys Adrift, and I would highly recommend both of those books to you because they're laden with research. Um, so he goes, he actually says this statement here. Let me see if I, it'll let me advance my slide. So he says, sexuality is good but sexualization is bad. Sexuality is a part of your identity as a woman or a man, but feeling sexual, that's a healthy part of being human, a healthy part of becoming an adult. But sexualization is about being an object for the pleasure of others or being on display for others. Sexuality is part of who you are. Sexualization is about how you look. So um, what's, uh, one of the things I feel like that Dr. Sachs does not address in his book is fathers. Now, I, didn't get to, I haven't gotten to the last chapter on solutions, so I'm wa I've gotten to every chapter but that one. So I'm waiting for him to bring that out. Because to me, he's addressing a lot of clear things on cutting, on um, drinking amongst young girls and teenage girls. Um, he, he addresses uh, oral sex and all the other sorts of sex that, uh, that these girls are engaging in. But fatherhood is brought up. So I'm going to try to maybe put that chapter in today for, with our conversation. So let me give you some statistics about the state of girls today. And I like to say daughters because whether you, and I was going to poll you, I was going to have you download an app where, and I do this with my students a lot, I was going to have you download an app and then ask you some anonymous questions so we can see the statistics up here. But I figured that would take too much time and I wanted to just cut to it. But regardless if you had a good relationship or a bad relationship or no relationship with your father, you're still somebody's daughter. Every girl is somebody's daughter out there. So I want you to think of every woman in the porn industry, every woman that's trafficked, every woman that's taken advantage of, every woman that's exploited, or every woman who is exploiting themselves and they don't realize it or why they're doing it is somebody's daughter. And having become a father myself, that has been a game changer for me. Now, I'm not saying all of you guys need to go out there and become fathers really quickly so you can see girls in a better light. That would probably kind of be uh, ironic and tragically ironic. Um, but you should be preparing for that, and I hope you'll be thinking about it in that light. Okay, so you may wonder what this, these, statistics, these data have to do with this conversation. You can see on the, I guess it's your left-hand side of the screen, those are tweens. On the right hand is teens. The blue is boys, the red is girls. So you can see uh, as they, the boys in the tweens, they are, spend more time on uh, video games and girls on social media. That shouldn't be a surprise to any of us. When you see when they hit the adolescent years, it goes up quite a bit for both. In fact, the girls decrease in video game time and the boys go up um, quite a bit. Um, and then, they, of course, they go up in social media as well. And the girls drastically increase in social media. Well, this may not mean anything to you other than so what? Well, let me give you some things that are tied to that. Well, here on the screen you'll see some uh, research just in an infographic style that the, the vast number of individuals who struggle with eating disorders are women. And there's some research now that suggests that, that the social media craze that um, women are engaging in is fueling this. Men don't struggle with body image issues nearly as much. And if they do, it's in a different way. So we all know that social media, I think you just know this, just you compare your worst self to everybody's best selves. It just fuels comparison. It fuels superficiality. And teenager, or teenage girls who really don't have any working model, we call that cognitive working model, or social script, one, one uh, expert calls that, or a sexual script, they don't really know what's happening. And if they don't have any reference point, they're just going to think this is normal and good. In fact, if you interview teenage <coughs> girls who don't have any reference point of what's healthy and good, then they're going to be socialized and taught other way. And so let's get to another statistic here. On the top, you'll see um, one trend. The average is the middle. On the bottom is men. On the top is women or girls. This is age, uh, grades 9 to 12. You'll see this is, um, they were sampled uh, depressive symptoms, whether it's major or minor depressive symptoms. So 
girls, I guess in short, girls on average for the most part struggle with depression and anxiety more so than boys. It's not that boys don't, but again, social media is one of those causes for that, but there's a lot of other causes. Think of this more like a recipe where there's a lot of ingredients into a stew and sometimes you need to put ingredients into a certain order and other times you can just throw them all together and have a certain outcome. But these things are all feeding off of each other. Let me give you another one. You all know the, the trend on out of wedlock childbearing. It's over 40%. This is up to 2010 and it's been on the rise. Now some people will think if, if it stops and that's a good thing. Well, I want to know why it stops, stops, not just that it stops. Right? Because we're getting more contraception and abortion and, uh, to these girls, then that's a different way of stopping it than other ways. So we'll get to those diagnoses in a moment. Now here's some trends on uh, rates of chlamydia, sexual transmitted infection. Girls also across all ethnic cultures, racial backgrounds, they um, contract chlamydia, chlamydia at a much higher rate than boys do in the adolescent years. And that also has been found to disrupt or make it impossible to reproduce if it goes either undiagnosed or untreated. Uh, here's another one. So as far as people who are trafficked, sex trafficked, whether it's boys or girls, men or women, it's women are primarily the more often the victims. Girls are more often the victims. Boys are too. So I share all this research with you to show, to try to explain something. And that is where, I, that you probably, again, already know. We're wired to connect. Uh, theorists such as, well, I'll show you a little clip here of where this came from, attachment theory. I don't know how many of you have heard of attachment theory. I know my students have because they're in the social sciences. Um, but that really came from Harry, Harry Harlow, his research on rhesus monkeys. I'm going to let you watch this little clip. In a now famous experiment, psychologist Harry Harlow took newborn rhesus monkeys away from their mothers and allowed them to choose between two artificial mothers. One made of wire provided food but no comfort. The other, covered in cloth, provided some comfort but no food. Time and again, the baby monkeys chose the cloth mother over the wire mother suggesting that even a little bit of soft comfort was more important to them than food. And this simple, basic so I'm going to stop it there. Now, what they've found basically from that, uh, Mary Ainsworth and John Bowlby have done a lot of research that, s that spurred on this attachment theory field, and now it's been um, studied throughout adult relationships as well, showing that you can provide everything for a child, and if you starve them of love, you can destroy its life throughout their life. There's a sensitive period that they really need to be attached. Why is this important for daughters and for fathers? Well, it started off just with mothers. They only studied mother attachment. It wasn't until the 90s we started seeing the impact of fathers on this. And I love the, uh, the fatherhood has been referenced throughout this conference. Um, I would submit that most of the problems that you've seen in the, all that data, all the, those charts that I showed you, is because they don't know who they are. These girls don't know who they are. And you learn that primarily from being connected to your mother and father. And fathers offer a specific nutrition, metaphorically, than mothers do. And I have seen that most of these problems, whether it's with cutting, self-esteem issues, body image issues, um, allowing themselves to be exploited, um, on and on and on, are usually symptoms of the problem of not being connected or bonded properly with one or more parents. Um, they really don't know how to connect with other people. That lays the foundation. So let's talk more about that and where that comes from. So disrupting connection, I'm going to throw a bunch of things on the screen and you're going to get probably, well, let's see, hopefully I didn't go too far here. There we go. Um, hookup culture, sexualization of girls, pornography, sex trafficking, consent-based marriage. Now. That's, Professor George has talked about the comprehensive view or the conjugal view. The contrast to that would be the romantic base that's all about the emotional romantic feelings of two or more adults. That's how the other vision of marriage. So consent-based marriage to me is, is a natural byproduct of a lot of these things. No-fault divorce, uh, non-marital childbearing, co uh, cohabitation, abortion, mental health, depression, cutting, we could get, uh, body image issues. Um, eating disorders, excessive video and online gaming, 
excessive so screen and social media, abuse and neglect, drugs and alcohol. So if you look, if you study all these issues, you can see that the family breakdown is being fueled by this, and these things are fueling the family breakdown. It, it's a causal and a, well, it's a correlational thing, but it's a cause and effect. So what's, what's the chicken and what's the egg? You could say that most of these are um, fueling family breakdown, but as the family breaks down, these things come in to replace it. We're trying to find some sort of artificial substitute on this connection. Something. So if, some, if your child's hungry and every time they're hungry you throw a Twinkie at them, they're going to start to get some feeling of fullness, but they're going to get sick eventually because you're not giving them the nutrition they need. And that's kind of what we're doing to ourselves with our society and these relationships being interrupted. Last, I had the privilege of speaking in Moldova at the World Congress of Families last month. I think it was last month. I'm, it's all running together. While we were out, I, was going, I went out there with my wife and we stopped in England and in Hyde Park in London, there's a place called Speaker's Corner. Some of you may be familiar with it. And it was a Sunday afternoon. We were walking through Hyde Park and there were I, all these men, mostly men, 95% men, arguing and talking to each other. And I had no idea what was going on, but they're all hearing each other on some philosophy, trying to convince each other on their new ideas. And it was very, I, I liked that they were engaging it. I saw a man who was holding the sign and my wife pointed over at him, trying to be inconspicuous. And this is what the sign said. Thank you for not breeding. And then he says, this is from all these people who are thanking him, children and blah, blah, blah. So he saw me look at a sign and then he kind of goes like, hey, you want to engage right now? I'm like, oh, not really. So I walked over and he said, I'll, I'll give you the short version and I'll cut out all the profanity that he used. He said that, um, it, that it's despicable that parents would bring children into this immoral, decadent, cruel world and it's impossible to raise children in this world because there's no way you can influence them more than the world can. And I was like, well, I agree with you halfway on this. Um, and I said, are you a parent? He's like, yeah, I have three children. <laughs> and I said, do you love your children? Yes, but I regret it. I shouldn't have done it. And I said, but you love your children. So you regret being a father. No, I didn't say that. I'm like, well, you kind of did. And so we're going back and forth and he's just not being very reasonable. So my wife and I had to get somewhere, so we couldn't really unpack this discussion as much as I would like. But he was, he thought it was just, the way to solve a lot of our problems today is just not bring children into the world. And I see this again and again, whether it's at the policy level, it's on social media, it's in the mass media, or you're just in public discourse, the way to solve problems is to use the old woman who swallowed the fly analogy. Now you gotta swallow a spider, then you gotta swallow a cat, and, you gotta, and pretty soon the woman implodes or explodes because she's trying to mask the symptom of the first behavior but with another one and then just kind of, and it just, that's what our society is doing to itself. And I was sad that he, this man did not, he talked about how much sacrifice it was to be a dad and how that's not really fair. I'm going, he goes, well, what's the purpose of a parent? And so I told him, it changes you if you let it. And he's like, oh, don't give me that bleep, 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 bleep. And I said, well, obviously it hasn't changed you. And anyhow, we kind of. <laughs> I was trying not to be too snarky. My wife was recording. I'm like, don't record this. Because <laughs> if I swear, no. Anyhow, so that kind of sets the tone for where I'm going with fatherlessness. Com contrast that man's statement with what you see here. Father's coming home from work. Probably tired. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. So, think about, that man could have said, you know, I deserve time to myself. I've been working hard. Coming home to provide for his family. And thinking that, just maybe I need to sit in front of ESPN or do whatever I want to do. That man had a moment right there. There was a decisive moment of selflessness that he actually found more joy in doing than he would have had he just been self-indulgent. And the man who's in Hyde Park, it saddened me that he does, never really experienced that. Raised three children and still never knew what that felt like. He didn't allow it to change him. Um, and I would tell you, those daughters, even though the father may never remember that moment, those daughters will remember those little uh, molecules, I, I think, Moments are the molecules, one wise man said, Mo moments are the molecules that make up eternity. And those daughters will remember those moments. That's where that connection is found. This man cares enough about me to spend time with me and to, and to, and to understand. I want to get more into that here in a moment. So 
to father a child. Here's a quote on that. It's very easy for a man to father a child. To father a child, unlike to mother a child, typically refers to a biological act, and men today don't seem to have much of a problem in that regard. But it is difficult for a man to be a father. To be a father rather merely to father means to give a child guidance, instruction, encouragement, care, and love. Fatherhood, the state of being a father, is declining to a remarkable degree because so many fathers are no longer living with their biological children. That's from Professor Popeno at Rutgers University. So you can look at this. This is uh, Yuri Bronfenbrenner, his ecological systems theory. If you look through this model, this is how a child develops. They have these closer systems that have a bigger impact on them, and then as the child grows, the child has a bigger impact on those systems. The further out you go, which is more of government and the larger culture, you can see how um, a sexualized hookup culture is being promoted and encouraged at every single level. And Yuri Bronfenbrenner says, who has the biggest influence on these children? After all of his research, he said, the family is the most humane, or sorry, the most powerful, the most humane, and by far the most economical system known for building competence and character. And the number one problem I have seen, looking at the sociological evidence, breaking up the family is fatherlessness. Because that's giving birth to all these other problems. So, um, let me give you some more statistics here. According to the U.S. Census, uh, about 24 million children are growing up in absent, uh, biological father absent homes. One out of three now live in that. One out of six are custodial. One out of every six custodial parents, 17.5 percent today, are fathers. And then in 1969, and 10 children resided with their two married parents. You can see a huge trend, a huge shift there. But we're, we've accepted this as normal and okay. Um, let me. I want to jump to some. Oh yeah, let's go to some data here because I haven't given you enough. So fatherlessness. Children growing up in fatherless homes are four times greater risk of poverty, seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teen, more likely to have behavioral problems, more likely to face abuse and neglect, two times greater risk of infant mortality. They're also more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, more likely to, to go to prison, tw twice as likely to suffer from obesity, more likely to commit crime, two times more likely to drop out of high school. You can see every domain of an individual, cognitively, psychosocially, bio, biologically or physically, is impacted by fatherlessness. But let's get more specific when it comes to father-daughter relationships. I know your favorite musical artist is Katy Perry, so I'm gonna quote her. She said, I don't need to do, this is in Rolling Stone magazine, I don't need a, a dude to have a, a kid or children. It's 2014. We're living in the future. I'm not anti-man, but I love, there, I love men. There's an option if someone doesn't present himself. So I told my daughters about this, and I said, could you please tell me the reaction you have to that? And this is the face that they gave. <laughs> so my daughter, Molly, who's 12, is the furthest one away. She's giving a look. So she always gives us like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Come on. She gives that all the time. And then Eleanor and Naomi are the other two. They're like, oh. So I like to always ask, Katie, could you tell these girls why... They don't need this dude that they call dad. Right? You can just do this on your own. Um, again, we're being socialized to believe that that's okay. So let's get specific on the father-daughter relationship and what that means. So Linda Nielsen, I consider her one of the foremost experts on father-daughter relationships. She's at Wake Forest University, um, so ironically a professor of women's studies. She says this, True, most fathers and mothers relate differently to their kids, but why would we want that to be, them to be identical? That's one of the benefits of being raised by a mom and a dad. They don't always do things the same way, but this doesn't mean that one parent is inferior to the other. We're not doing father-daughter relation, father relationships any good, and we're being sexist when we assume that dad's way of parenting are inferior to mom's because he's a man. So, let's give you a little bit more on this. Daughters who are raised in a home have with a respectful, loving, active, communicating father have the advantages over other daughters in the following areas. Not being overly dependent on men. Now notice the relationship here between a lot of the things we've already discussed already. Not abusing drugs and alcohol, not being imprisoned, uh, be <clears throat> being academically and professionally successful, not being raped or sexually abused, not developing an eating disorder, Dealing uh, well with those in authority, especially men being secure and self-confident. Sometimes we think we empower a woman from without. We just got to get rid of social barriers so they can be empowered. That's only helpful to a certain extent. This shows us that girls are empowered from within 
from their moms too, but from their dads, especially as you look at this. Now, if you want to know how they're different from mom, here's this huge list, and I won't read through them all right now, of how dads interact with their daughters differently than their mothers. And I'll just give you a few. Challenge daughters intellectually. It doesn't mom, mean moms don't do it, but dads do this more often than not. One of my favorites is uh, discourage daughters from whining and feeling sorry for themselves. <laughs> Um, this can be taken to an extreme. This can become a fault. Dads can be lacking empathy and they don't listen to their daughters very well, right? But um, there needs to be understanding and then there needs to be solutions when there's time for solutions. So that's quite a long list of things that dad do differently. Now, I'm going to give you a little way I describe this sometimes because when I was speaking at uh, this last time I spoke at the UN, a lesbian woman from Kazakhstan came up to me and she said, well, what about two, during the Q&A, she said, what about two moms? And I said, well, uh, I don't doubt that two moms can love their, children, their daughter perfectly and with the best intentions and everything. But metaphorically speaking, they offer different nutritions. And so if you, dads offer the nutritions maybe for vegetables and moms from fruit or dads from meat and moms. And you can have 50 moms and they could never provide the same nutrition that a dad can provide. So where I believe you can still raise the children and love them perfectly it doesn't mean you're always going to meet all their needs because mothering and fathering are distinct and separate phenomena. And so, um, in fact, you didn't, I wasn't not trying to invite an argument. I don't think she was. I think she was really curious about this. But most of our culture doesn't, academia doesn't really like to talk about that. But, but there's loads, loads of evidence. Uh, but that's really not, a, unfortunately, a, a very good argument today. I've already talked about the impact on daughters on... Uh, uh, teen pregnancy. Let me hit one that I think is the quintessential quote from Professor Nielsen from Wake Forest. And if I could say this is probably the theme of what I'm trying to convey today. And that is the father has the greater impact on the daughter's ability to trust, enjoy, and relate to the males in her life. It seems even evolutionary psychology research says that there's some sort of void, some sort of hole that girls are born with and only that male father figure can fill. Now, it, ideally we want it to be the biological father, but other males can, can do that if they do it in the right way. And if it's not filled, she will be seeking out other things to try to fill that, usually in unhealthy ways. Let me give you some examples of that. So, girls whose fathers are present involved in their lives, um, they, ha they experience delayed menarche, onset of puberty, which actually has a lot of physical ramifications as well later in life. Um, and, well, I won't, I'm trying to think how much deep I want to get into this. No, I think if it comes up in the Q&A, and it comes up in the Q&A. Um, more likely to have healthy view of intimacy and sexuality, meaning they're less likely to compartmentalize sex, sex like a lot of men do today, seeing that sex is, I can be emotionally, physically, intellectually, uh, spiritually intimate with another person. It's not just physical intimacy. So fathers can do that in a very powerful way. Le they have less sexual partners before marriage. If fa fa fathers also help their daughters be far more likely to forge healthy relationships with men and more likely to become, um, they're much less likely to become sexually exploited. So here's a quote from a girl that was interviewed. She said, my dad never compliments me about how I look. I wish he would, especially during times when I have no boyfriend. Even at my school dance, when I was dressed up like a bride, he never told me once I looked pretty. Again, she's going to fill that void somehow. Dads, is it going to be you? Here's another one. My dad has always been distant. My mom is clinically depressed, so I prefer random one-night stands with no attachment involved. I pick guys I feel superior to and can control. I don't just trust people, especially men. I close up emotionally and never want to depend on men for anything. Um, well, I won't comment much further on this. So what does it mean to exploit? Because I like to give definitions, so we're all singing from the same hymnal, as it were. Make full use of or derive benefit from a resource, or use a situation or a person in an unfair, selfish way. The hookup culture has given men a free pass to, to be as sexual as you want. And it's told girls to be the same way. Um, but what these men don't realize is that they're taking advantage of, especially fatherless girls or girls who come from abusive fatherless father homes, 
taking advantage, they're totally exploiting that for their own benefit, their own selfish motives. If you don't believe me, I have a bunch of interviews from women who were in the porn industry that got out. They were part of the Pink Cross Foundation, and I did a little qualitative analysis, a lot of their stories. Now, none of them, I have to tell you, none of them got out and said, I'm going to tell you specific things about my story, where they're going to say, I want to make sure I highlight on these. They were just telling their story. Organically, it came out. But I went in and I specifically looked for certain languages to confirm this, this, this research I've been showing you. So let me give you a few excerpts. This was from Melissa. She said, my heart was saying, and a lot of these names have been changed, so there's no identifying. But a lot of, a lot of my heart was saying, no, I can't do this, meaning stripping. I was scared to death but I'd seen all the money. The attention from men and money were too good to pass up. Notice I highlighted the word, the attention from men. I'm gonna skip down here. I already had a past of abuse by men, including my alcoholic father who beat my mother daily and then shot himself in the head in front of me when I was nine years old. So I never received the healing or understood what love meant. Stripping offered me the attention I, and love I desperately craved and because I was naive, I swallowed the lie. If you're not depressed enough, let me give you another one. I loved the attention from everyone, but not, now that I look back, that's not the kind of attention I needed. I think that's quite telling. <coughs> but I was young, naive, motivated by the money and all the fame, and it was easy for an agent to take advantage of me. And many did. Over the course of my porn career, I've been belittled and treated like a piece of trash more than I could ever imagine in a lifetime I would. I wasn't put in any of these, I wasn't a woman in any of the director's eyes. I was nothing to them. They have no respect for women. Here's from Ashley. I felt that no one could truly love me. And then finally here from Genevieve. I was going to get the attention I always loved and wanted, and I wanted and it, I, I loved and created attention. Now skipping down to the last two sentences. I love the attention, I, but I was jaded and was used to the whole porn world. I learned to depend on men to take care of me. I wanted a father so much. I've got another one, but I'm not going to belabor the point. Let me give to a little bit on um, a little bit here on the, what one study found. Psychologically, the authors predict that, uh, that young girls who've been victimized in the past by family members, they are more likely to believe that it is acceptable for strangers to ex exploit and abuse them also. Furthermore, these fatherless girls had a distorted view of themselves in which they define their worth by the success of using their bodies as sexual objects. They are also somewhat enticed to, to be able to sexually manipulate men. So Operation Underground Railroad is an organization I've worked with before. They go in undercover in third world countries to try to rescue victims of sex trafficking. And I was speaking with them, and this is some of the the things that they have found when they've rescued these boys and girls in sex trafficking. 90% of them are um, homeless and runaway children, are from fatherless homes. The majority of sex trafficking victims in the United States are runaways from broken homes. And one in three uh, children will be forced into prostitution with 48 hours of being on the streets. And here's a quote, pimps lure and keep their victims uh, is to present some sort of family unit structure. Now, Professor George talked about this, replacing the family like gangs. It is not uncommon for a female victims to call their pimps daddy or to refer to other victims who work for them as family. Um, how many of you have ever heard of 16 and Pregnant or Teen Mom? There was a, okay, quite a few. There's, there's a study that was quite interesting. They looked at girls between, in the teenage years, and they asked them, how many times have you viewed this show? And how often does your mom talk to you about sex? And how often does your dad talk to you about sex? The more often, the girls who their fathers rarely talk to the, them about sex, it increased sexual intercourse and sexual encounters exponentially. The girls whose fathers talked to them about sex, the more they watched, the less um, sexual activity there was. Dads offered a buffer between the sexual hookup cu culture, um, and when they weren't there, they didn't have any sexual script to go off of, so they just thought that was normal. It was, so basically, it's in the eye of the beholder, and the eye, the eye of the beholder needs to be shaped by mom and dad. Moms didn't have nearly the impact this study found. Um, so dads have a protective way, right? When my girls talk about girls, boys that they like, I get this little mm in me and I'm just like, all right, what's his name? And you're not talking to him until you're at least 25. <laughs> um, now, that's, I think that's just normal for dads to feel that way. You can't be overbearing and controlling like that. But I have one daughter who's so boy crazy. And I just, 
I worry about her. But she's pretty healthy in the way she views things. I, what is it that you like about them? And my other daughter just like, I don't even care about boys right now because I'm not even going to date them. Why do my friends like girl, boys so much? I mean, I'm not looking to get married. I'm only 12. I'm like, that's right. Keep thinking that way for a long time. <laughs> and uh, this is what one father tried to do. I think it was really sweet. I, McKenna. I, McKenna. I, McKenna. Promise. Promise. Daddy. Daddy. That I will not. That I will not. Have any boyfriends. That I will not. <laughs> have any boyfriends. Say it. <laughs> that I will not have any boyfriends. I just want to look at them though. <laughs> Well-intentioned, good dad. That's my Naomi, that's exactly what she would do. I just wanna look at them and I'm like, huh. So, so I guess, let me give you a, a, a summary on this, and that is dads offer a, um, a protective, an outer protection of trying to stave off, if he's involved with his daughter's life, he, he's been a boy, he's been a teenager, he knows what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're deciding. So he can communicate that to his daughters. He can be very protective externally, but he also has an internal cognitive and psychological and biological protection. He naturally delays menarche and sexual development, and she has a better view of herself. She has stronger self-esteem. She's less likely to be taken advantage of because she knows who she is and she's strong inwardly. She knows how, uh, how to interact with boys. So dads have such an outward and inward impact on the protection of these girls. Um, in fact, let's bring it to uh, our good, f <laughs> the uh, Grammy, I think, this, I think he won a Grammy for this, John Mayer. He summarized the research quite well. Um, I know he likes to pontificate a lot, but I don't think he was reading the research, but I think he naturally gets this. Father's bigger to your daughters, daughters will love. That entire song is about a girl who has a hard time making a good relationship with a guy because her dad was never really there to, to guide her, to teach her, to put that connection, that attachment inside. So she's trying to attach with other men and she doesn't know how. Some women will run away from men when this happens and some will feed off of men and become objects and they think that that's how they're supposed to be loved. Um, now, I could, oh, I probably have a hundred slides, but I'm not going to go through, I wasn't planning on going through them, don't worry, death by keynote. Um, I, I have probably another 30 slides where I could, now we talk about pornography, what pornography does to a father, because men are the, the largest consumers of it, and men were once boys, and boys are looking at pornography at a younger and younger age, now he's being sexualized in a certain way. He's also less likely to want to commit to the woman he's had sex with who ends up having a child. And then when, when pornography is in the home, let's say the mom and dad are married. When pornography is in the home, here's what happens. Some studies have found that decreased father time and attention and affection. Notice there's one, the dad is looking at the, uh, with the daughter on the lap. The other one, the dad's just looking at pornography. Obviously the one on the lap, he's looking at something else. Um, increased risk of encountering pornographic material, increased risk of father separation divorce, increased risk of dad losing job and financial strain. And we could actually give a lot more than that. So we see the sexualized hookup culture and pornography breaking down the family and separating fathers from children, whether before they become uh, married or after they become married. Then we also see the porn industry being fueled by fatherless daughters. So most of the girls at least uh, I would predict, and we haven't done an official study on this, I would predict that most of the girls who are in the porn industry are from fatherless homes or from father abusive homes or just a really bad connection with their dad. And you saw that from some of the qualitative stories that I read to you. Um, here is a uh, thing that I had drawn up. So uh, here's a, a vicious cycle. So here on the very end, you've got 
a cold and distant father, the girl's reaching up to him. Then you have distorted view of love, because he's now yelling at her, and whether he's verbally abusive or just not affectionate. Then you have a vulnerable daughter, discordant rela um, relationships with men, the daughter's not happy, now she's getting attention from other men. And you could just really rinse and repeat this cycle. Obviously, there's exceptions to this, and this is not causality. And if, if you're a girl sitting here thinking, oh, I didn't have a good relationship with my dad, I'm destined to... No, that's not the case at all. But it is a common trend that we're seeing strong correlations with. Now, the auspicious cycle, I like to uh, say, is an involved father, and then a healthy view of intimacy and love. Notice that that's husband and wife together. She grows up, she ends up marrying a good man, having a daughter, again, rinse and repeat the other way. Um, I asked my daughters what, in fact, I'll show you a little picture here. Uh, I, this, well, well, let me back up a little bit. Um, we can't legislate this. You can't change uh, the desires of men simply through policy. Pat Fagan, my good friend, says that social policy is abysmal at trying to create behavioral change. Now, it can shape culture, and it can trickle down, but how are we going to get these men like the man in Hyde Park? How can we get men to start realizing that there's more to life than themselves, that their own sexual pleasure? Or um, we talked about the failure to launch phenomenon and all the um, other issues that are going on with men. How can we do this? Um, and turning the tide of the hookup culture and sexu sexualization is not going to happen simply through mandating it or addressing symptoms. We can, address, we can prescribe NyQuil all we don't want all day long, and it's, it'll, we'll, we can cover up the symptoms, the coughing and the sneezing and the sore throat, but we need the antibiotic. The family, fatherhood, and strong marriage culture are the antibiotic. That's going to take time. And that's going to take each of us living the, the truth about this in our own lives and teaching the importance of this to our friends and to our, um, in our spheres of influence. So this relationship can destroy the hookup culture. This is a picture my daughter Naomi drew about three or four years ago. That's her and I dancing. One of my favorite things is that I'm super tall. <laughs> Although I pull my, heck, my pants up pretty high. <laughs> Uh, but my favorite thing of all is that we're dancing and there's hearts over our head. Um, I, there's very few joys I can, other than with my own wife that I can say I've experienced in my life than this. This is the antibiotic. This is the remedy. My daughter Molly and I went to a daddy-daughter dance. And I think every dad should do dates with both of his children. I'm glad it was mentioned in a couple presentations. Um, I think I even have Eleanor represented here. It's a picture she drew while we were at church. And this is my wife and I standing next to her holding hands. And on the back, in broken English, because at the time she wrote at age five, she wrote Dre, which means deer. I thought she was calling me Dr. Dre, but maybe not. <laughs> Dre, mom and dad, dear mom and dad, I love you. You're the best mom and dad. Thank you for giving me clothes. <laughs> and clothes is C-O-S-E, so. <laughs> it is so cute. And then she put, I love you, from Eleanor to mom and dad. I asked my daughters what kind of man they want to marry. I said, what, who do you want to marry? Um, I don't want to know who now because I want, I'm going to take care of him. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to know, um, what are you looking for? And Naomi said, I want somebody who's kind that will treat me right. Sorry. The way I see you treat mom. Girls have such a healing effect and sons when that is modeled in the marriage the family is never stronger than the marriage which I'm glad this panel talked about taking time for the marriage because that's critical I know too many couples who once they empty nesters they don't know what to do themselves because all the time was put into the children now that can be put extremely reverse I was so grateful to hear my daughter say that and she said I want somebody who's also strong like you and I'm like well, I'm 
Are you talking about me? Oh, you're talking about me, okay. <laughs> but that was um, a, a sign for me that I wasn't totally failing, because sometimes I do as a father. You're going to screw up. I'm not a good father all the time. But this sort of relationship can really turn the tide of the hookup culture, because there'll be less demand for it. People will start to feel the real love and connection. They won't feel they have to go to these artificial substitutes. Thank you very much.